Captain Midnight. This video is brought to you by Brilliant. After 15 years, Daniel Craig is finally giving up the mantle of James Bond, with No Time to Die representing the end of an era for the character. At first, I planned for this video to be a fairly straightforward review of the movie, but the more I thought about the film, the more I wanted to zoom out, to contextualize what Craig did for the role and take a look back at his tenure and really the franchise as a whole. I've never made a video about Bond before, but it's a series that actually means a lot to me. I remember getting super into everything 007 in middle school. First through games like GoldenEye and Everything or Nothing, then renting every old Bond movie I could find at the video store and reading through the old Fleming novels. At one point, I was so obsessed with the character that I like kept a notebook where I graded how each movie executed each Bond thing. Like The World Is Not Enough would get an A for that exciting pre-title sequence, whereas Diamonds Are Forever would get a C for the lazy way that Sean Connery said his iconic Bond, James Bond catchphrase in it. You could just tell his heart wasn't in it like it was in Dr. No. So yeah, needless to say, I took James Bond very seriously. Probably too seriously. So when Casino Royale came out when I was 13, it was like a revelation. Craig's James Bond performance was distinct from anyone who had played the character before, while still being very recognizably Bond. It was, and in all honesty probably still remains, my favorite Bond movie. Since then, Craig's films have had some high highs and some rocky lows, but before I get to those, I want to talk about how Craig's Bond effectively uses the elements of previous 007s to create this take on the character. Oh, and there will be spoilers for No Time to Die along the way. Bond, James Bond, is blasting his way onto Nintendo 64 in the game version of the hit feature film, Goldeneye. I once read a quote from Roger Moore about Bond that's very simple and has always stuck with me. Bond doesn't particularly like killing, but he takes great pride in being able to do it well. Even though it was Moore who said it, I've always felt this applied really well to Connery's Bond. For all his charm, there's a casual callousness to his violence that wouldn't become a major element to the character again until Craig took over the role. You always get the sense that Connery's Bond would be just as happy like murdering an entire table of shady henchmen as he would be playing cards with them. He really effectively conveyed that danger. A sense of 60s style, humor, and class that barely concealed a pretty cold, calculating killer that would gun down a villain and not feel a thing about it. Craig's Bond would borrow a lot from Connery, but crucially, not all of it, and I'll get to that in a bit. Moore's 007 could be pretty cold too, of course, like Bond isn't exactly a character known for wearing his emotions on his sleeve. But by the end of Connery's era, 007 was growing more cartoonish, and the Moore era, for the most part, doubled down on this. His Bond is almost a Bugs Bunny figure. He dispatches villains with a smirk and a one-liner, his suit and hair hardly ever even getting ruffled. So much of the Craig era seems ashamed of this kind of Bond. And I don't think it was until No Time to Die and to a lesser extent Spectre that you can see its influence kind of poke back through. But where Moore would deliver a zinger like he had just said the smartest, classiest line ever, Craig's wary deliver always signals to the viewer that his Bond knows this line is pretty damn stupid too. For better or worse, the Craig era is almost defined in opposition to the excesses of the Moore and Pierce Brosnan Bonds. Timothy Dalton I've always felt a little bad for. He only did two films, and in them you can really feel him straining for the kind of revitalization of the character that Casino Royale achieved. It's not that he wasn't a good enough actor to pull it off, I think he definitely was. His bond is defined by this barely concealed sense of anger that I find really interesting, but at times it feels like his own movies are kind of working against him. His films were directed by John Glenn, an old studio guy who directed later Roger Moore bonds like A View to a Kill. License to Kill did take some risks, but overall it felt like they were trying to fit Dalton's new, angrier take on Bond into films that were too tonally similar to what came before, not willing to rock the boat enough to really let his version of the character shine. Craig's Bond, to me at least, kind of feels like the culmination of what Dalton was trying to do with the character. Then there's Pierce Brosnan, who I've just always had a big soft spot for. The man feels like he was grown in a lab to play James Bond. He's a bit grittier and cooler than Roger Moore while still retaining a lot of that goofball humor. 
And while, other than GoldenEye, I don't think any of his 007 movies are great, they are fun and reliable. Okay, maybe not Die Another Day, but a movie like The World Is Not Enough is the Bond formula refined down to its most basic and enjoyable elements. Sure, you won't find much to get emotionally invested in, but you'll get an awesome ski chase. And you know what? That's not nothing. You may have noticed though that there's one Bond that I left out, and in fact it's his movie that has the most direct connection to No Time to Die, with both the script and the soundtrack pulling direct inspiration from it. That of course is George Lazenby's Honor Majesty's Secret Service. This was actually one of the first Bond movies I ever watched because it was always available at my video store. The Brosnan, Connery, and even more films were often rented out, but Lazenby? No one cared about George Lazenby's Bond. It felt even more off-brand than the actually off-brand Never Say Never Again. But I think people were missing out because this has always been one of my favorites. I think it's also the key to unlocking Craig's take on the character. See, Lazenby wasn't an actor, he was a model. So the producers wisely decided to pair him up with the legendary Diana Rigg, who you may know from Game of Thrones. She plays a far more central role here than the Bond love interests had before her, and you really buy her as someone that Bond would have real feelings for. Especially this version of Bond, who feels far younger and more naive than Connery's shark in a tuxedo. And when he loses her, there's a real grief and shock that wouldn't reappear in a Bond film until Casino Royale, 37 years later. No Time to Die is bookended by versions of Honor Majesty's iconic line, We Have All the Time in the World, and ends with Louis Armstrong's song of the same name from that film. That felt incredibly fitting, the Craig era in its final movie acknowledging the one Bond film that kind of forms the cornerstone of this version of Bond. Daniel Craig is a far better actor than Lazenby was in 1969, but his performance carries a hint of Lazenby throughout. In many ways, he's Lazenby's Bond, desperately trying to be Connery's 007. He has that ice-cold killer persona that Connery had, this feeling that this guy has seen everything, from the heights of high-class society to seeing himself through some truly grimy and violent situations. He's experienced it all, so nothing can touch him and nothing can hurt him. With Connery, that felt real. With Craig's Bond, it feels like a mask he's desperately trying to keep on so he doesn't fall into a total pit of despair. There's a moment in No Time to Die that I think gets at this so well. I don't think I have a clip of it available, but I really wish I did. Those who have seen the movie though will probably know exactly what I'm talking about. Bond has just discovered that Madeline may have betrayed him, and they're sitting in his superpowered Aston Martin as a henchman shoots her window over and over again. Bond doesn't react, he just sits there with this like dead stare. Unable to believe that after everything he's been through, he may have let himself be betrayed again. And there's a moment there where it really feels like he may let them both die. He doesn't, and a great car chase continues, but it's moments like that that separate Craig's take on the character from the rest. You get the sense that to continue what he does for a living, Craig's Bond has to kill something inside himself over and over again. That feeling that he doesn't have to be this remorseless killer. It would never occur to Brosnan or Moore's Bond to want anything else in life. They're having way too much fun. But everything Craig's Bond does weighs on him heavily, haunting him every step of the way. When he says the bitch is dead after Vesper's death, he's giving up on the part of him that actually feels anything, something he's really able to rediscover in this film. Now, there's a segment of Bond fans who will say that all of this is way, way too weighty for Bond, that his dourness really drags down Craig's movie. After all, at the end of the day, aren't these supposed to be fun? And I totally understand where they're coming from. I'm a lot more likely to rewatch like Brosnan's Tomorrow Never Dies than Spectre. It offers a certain brand of breezy fun that Craig's Bond often doesn't. But I'm still really happy that we got the Craig era. Sure, it wasn't always great. Quantum of Solace was a rush mess with some great action set pieces, and Spectre got way into its own mythology. But overall, I think it gave us a really distinct Bond when the franchise needed it most. And No Time to Die gave that character a really fitting ending. 
For one thing, over the course of the last 10 years or so, the Bond films quietly became the best looking blockbuster series out there. Director Kerry Fukunaga over delivers here visually. I mean, this movie looks incredible. All the on location shooting delivers exactly what it did for movie audiences all the way back in the 60s, making these locales look like amazing exotic places that I want to jump on a plane and fly to right now. The action is great, and Craig continues to feel incredibly comfortable and believable in his stunts in a way that someone like Roger Moore never really was. I think the film is dragged down by its villain. Rami Malek's character should have been played by an actor closer to Craig's own age, and he kind of feels like a theater kid playing dress up here. But for the most part, this delivered everything that I wanted from Craig's finale. We got a good and surprisingly moving send-off to Jeffrey Wright's Felix Leiter, who I think is going down in the books as the definitive take on the character. We get a pretty solid last go-around for these versions of Q, Moneypenny, and M. And I think the new temporary 007 fit into the cast nicely, giving Bond someone to play off of in that last act. But I guess I like have to talk about the end, right? So Bond dies here. To save the world, he sacrifices himself and the life he could have had with Madeline and his daughter. It's a fitting end to Craig's Bond, both tragic and bittersweet. I was a little surprised though to see everyone online being like, where do they go from here? He's dead. The end of the credits promise, as most 007 movies do, that James Bond will return. Was this a more definitive send-off for Craig than Die Another Day was for Brosnan? Definitely. But James Bond is James Bond. I'm sure he'll be back in a new form someday soon because our modern hangups about continuity are just not very important to this franchise overall. As it stands, I'm really glad we got a real ending for this version of the character. And I'm willing to bet that we'll look back fondly on the whole Craig era 10 or 20 years from now. I think each of the Bond actors fit really perfectly into their time and place. From the Playboy 60s style of Connery to the Miami Vice inspired 80s grittiness of Dalton, Craig was exactly that for the 2000s and 2010s, and I'm excited to see what's in store next. Bond. James Bond Jr. You know, there are times when I wish I was actually good at impressions because I was gonna try to do this next part in like a Q voice, but I am very, very bad at acting. So instead, I'll just say that I really want to thank today's sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant is amazing and definitely worth checking out. They take what could have been boring lectures and turn them into really fun, STEM-focused challenges. They make things like engineering, with its topics like trigonometry and solar energy, actually understandable and fun to learn. Earlier this year, they actually upped the interactivity on the platform, so Brilliant does an even better job of letting you explore these topics and build on your skills. Things like geometry fundamentals are easier than ever to learn, not by memorizing rote formulas, but by trying things out for yourself. Honestly, as someone who always felt intimidated by math and struggled with it, Brilliant is kind of a godsend. It's structured around you learning at your pace and on your schedule. So it's never been easier to tackle these topics head on. So to build on your knowledge, go to brilliant.org slash midnight and try it for free. Oh, and also the first 200 people to go to that link in the description will get 20% off the annual premium subscription. Here's a special tip for the fellas and girls who have not already joined Captain Midnight's new 1940 flight patrol. You'd better hurry up and join at once because there's a big adventure ahead. The thing to do now is to get started, because we're going to have not only barrels of fun, but loads of free gifts and prizes too.